Hello, everyone. Welcome to New Ideal Live. This is the video and podcast series of New Ideal, the journal of the Ayn Rand Institute. My name is Ilan Journal. On this series, we discuss the complex issues and events shaping our world from the perspective of Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism, a philosophy that upholds the ideals of reason, individualism, and capitalism. You can find our publication at newideal.aynrand.org. For those of you watching on YouTube or Facebook or Periscope on the live stream, you can join the Q&A live by connecting with us on Zoom. Go to zoom.us and enter the meeting ID 812-506-718. It's time to build. That's what Mark Andreessen argues in a new essay published this weekend in which he reflects on a chaotic response to the pandemic. For those of you who have not heard of Mark Andreessen, he's a, an influential figure in Silicon Valley. He's an investor and himself has been a founder of several startup companies. When Andreessen puts out his views, whether on his blog or in, on a podcast or at an event, people listen and they respond. And in response to this article from Andreessen, It's Time to Build, uh, media has been really lighting up, uh, especially Twitter. Let me give you a flavor of how this piece opens. Uh, here's how Andreessen diagnoses the situation we're in. Every Western institution, this is a quote, every Western institution was unprepared for the coronavirus pandemic, despite many prior warnings. This monumental failure of institutional effectiveness will reverberate for the rest of the decade. But it's not too early to ask why and what we need to do about it. Close quote. Now, According to Andreessen, the reason we're in this situation where in New York City, for example, hospitals are putting out to get rain ponchos in order to use as gowns in, in, in emergency rooms, and where we have a shortage of cotton swabs for testing, and where we have a shortage of testing to begin with, and so many other things have gone wrong. Why we're in this situation, Andreessen argues, is that there's a widespread failure to build, and building is his, the theme of his article. There are a lot of powerful observations in this essay, and we'll put a link to it in the show notes for you uh, to read up on afterwards if you haven't already uh, read his piece. Uh, but I want to discuss it uh, with two people who have an interesting cross-section of expertise. Uh, they're both knowledgeable about Ayn Rand's ideas and philosophy, and they have lived and worked in Andreessen's world of tech startups and in the business world. So let me introduce them. Our, our two guests today are Tal Tsfani, and Jason Crawford. Hi, Tal. Hi, Jason. Let me make sure you guys are uh, there. I see your video, Tal, and there's Jason. Great. I just want to say a couple of words about each of you, and then I'll have you introduce yourself. So um, Tal is the CEO of the Iron Run Institute, as many of you probably know. But before that, he had a career uh, uh, in, involved in several startups uh, in the tech se sector, and he has an engineering background, and computer background. Uh, and also joining us is Jason Crawford, who's a writer and also an entrepreneur. Uh, he co-founded several companies and uh, he's worked in, in sort of this field for many years. And now Jason, sort of uh, his new chapter in life is he's a writer and a researcher and he runs the blog called Roots of Progress, which is really interesting. It's about the history of technology and industry and the story of human progress. So he has a lot of uh, really interesting perspective on these things. So thanks for joining us, Tal and Jason. Thanks a lot for having me. Happy to be. Well, as I said, I think you guys have a really interesting cross section of expertise and experience, and I think you both follow Mark Andreessen. You know him sort of well from the, sort of the, your, your careers in tech. So, first, give us like a, a thirty second summary of your background and career, and sort of your experiences in tech, and then we'll, we'll kind of dive into Andreessen's essay. Maybe we can start with you. Tal. Uh, so I've spent uh, over 20 years in the tech field, software specifically, worked for big companies, uh, relocated to the United States in 2006, managing big uh, software projects for AT&T. If you remember uh, rollover minutes, billing projects like that for AT&T, I, I was involved in that. But then uh, I joined the startup world. We started a, a, a CRM, Customer Relationship Management uh, Software uh, company in Chicago, then moved it to uh, Mountain View, California, ra ran it for uh, from 2013 to eight, so about five years in the Silicon Valley and then sold it in 2018 to a much bigger company. And then 
I decided, oh, actually I moved to another big uh, a startup that really blew up called MuleSoft and uh, then decided to change direction and, and uh, move to lead ARI. So that's, that's my history in the tech world. How about you, Jason? Yeah, uh, so my background is in computer science. That's what I, I studied and most of my career, I've been a software engineer, uh, an engineering manager and a startup founder. I have, uh, that's been about 20 years now that I've been doing those things. Um, I've lived in the San Francisco Bay Area for over a decade and been part of the sort of tech and startup community here. Um, in that time, I co-founded two uh, tech startups, both of which ended in sort of small acquisitions. And then yes, about uh, six months ago, after I left my last tech job, decided to focus on a personal writing project um, as you mentioned, my blog, The Roots of Progress, where I write about the history of industry and technology and the philosophy of human progress. Great. So why don't we dive in with Andreessen's essay? Because I, I mean, I, I think it's really powerful. Uh, and I, I think the first one I, I would want to just emphasize um, for people is just to get a sense of that. I think it took a lot of, it took a lot of courage to speak out on this issue, because I mean, it's become highly politicized so to understand what's going on with the pandemic and the, and the reactions to it. And I think a lot of what he's saying, I think, it, I mean, it resonates with me. I think he's making some really powerful observations. So just to give him a lot of credit for speaking out, and I think he's gonna get flack. I think that's unavoidable. So, it, um, but I'm sure he's got a thick skin. So, so I, I wanna get from you guys. Um, so this is how I take his argument to work or sort of the key lines of his argument. And then I wanna get your reactions to it. Um, so he's, he's analyzing how do we get here and what do we need to do to get out of this mess? And how did we get here is essentially there's a failure to build a failure of our imagination and, a, and it takes different manifestations. And he works through um, you know, the hospital level preparedness, government preparedness for pandemics. Then we get into industry, then we get into sort of why aren't we building more, more generally in the, as a culture? What, for example, all these, um, you know, like energy, why aren't there more nuclear power plants and things like that? And so it's a, in some ways, it goes much broader than the pandemic. And I think the scope of what he's trying to explain is not only why we're in this crisis of preparedness, but just like, look at our society. Where are all the flying cars? Why don't we have super travel? Which, which is really interesting that those are the things his mind goes to. Um, and, and, you know, and he, one telling anecdote, he says, well, look, they, it, Westworld was filming and they wanted the city of the future and they didn't fit the TV show on, uh, I think it's on HBO. Um, and where did they go to film the scenes of the city of the future? They didn't go to any American city. They went to Singapore because of the tall skyscrapers. And so he, he, there's a kind of uh, perspective on American life. So of which the pandemic is an element, but a big one where we're just not as you know, we're not building, we're not creating as much as he thinks we should. And so that's part of his diagnosis. So th that's what I take to be a main thrust of his argument. I, I wanna get, so let's start with you guys. What do you think he's getting right? What do you think he's getting wrong? What's your basic reaction? Why don't you start Jason? Cause you, you wrote a, a sure. piece about this on your blog, which I, I found quite uh, powerful. That's right, yeah. So I, I, I responded to this and added some thoughts. Okay, so a few things, first off, uh, you know, my immediate reaction to the piece and that of a lot of other people in, in my network and in Silicon Valley was just a deep yes, you know, amen. Um, and I think that was responding to the spirit of the spirit of building, right? He really, uh, I mean, what comes across in the piece is this very strong, positive, can do, optimistic, let's work, let's solve problems, let's make great stuff, let's move the world forward. This is how we've always done it. This is the, you know, he calls this, uh, you know, he talks about it, this is what America was built on and let's, let's, let's keep doing it. So it's very can-do and optimistic and, and I love that, I think a lot of people love that. And that is, I think that if you take one thing away from the whole piece, that's, that is the thing, that, that spirit um, is what to take away. Um, one thing I wanna note uh, because I've, I've seen, so I, I've seen a lot of positive reaction to this. I've read, I've seen a few negative reactions and read some of the criticisms. Um, one thing I, I just want to point out, I think when he uses the word build, which he does repeatedly, a few people interpreted that very narrowly to mean uh, like construction and manufacturing, like literally building physical things. And um, he does give a lot of examples of that, but I don't think this is, this is not a narrow point about which sectors or industries, you know, to, this is not like a, um, let's bring manufacturing back to America type of uh, discussion at all. This is about 
value creation, econ you know, economic value creation of all types. Um, and then uh, second, the other thing I just want to say is that I think that this is also not really to be read as a detailed or nuanced policy proposal of any type. This is a rallying cry. This is a, a, a manifesto, and it's really about the you know the spirit of the thing. Um, so that said, you know he uh, in terms of what I had to add to it, um, I think that uh, he so he names in one key paragraph a few different problems: um, desire or lack of desire for this kind of progress, uh, two inertia, too much you know status quo, um, regulatory capture. I definitely agree with. And then he just says, you know, will, like just deciding, you know, to, to go ahead and do it. Um, and I don't disagree, but I think there's a lot more that could be said about what are the problems and where do they come from. Um, so in my, in my post, I, I mentioned a few things. Uh, one, I think we simply, most people simply do not appreciate uh, pr progress. They don't appreciate technological, economic, and industrial progress. Uh, they don't appreciate how far we've come in just how, how much standard of living has improved in just the last you know couple hundred years um, and even the last you know decades. Um, they don't appreciate really how how much good this has done for everybody's lives and for the world. They don't appreciate how far we have to go. Um, some people seem to even if they're aware of how much progress has been made in the last couple hundred years, they seem to think, well, we've kind of done all the important things, and do we really need so much progress anymore? And um, and they don't have this vision of how much better uh, the future could be. So that's one key thing. And then uh, another thing is I think there are philosophic premises that get in the way. Um, uh, premises around environmentalism. So we worry that we're harming the environment or that uh, what we build is quote unquote unsustainable. Um, premises around inequality. We worry that, oh, what we build in, you know, uh, increases inequality rather than thinking about are we moving all of humanity forward? Um, uh, and then a lot of people just have deep philosophical premises against capitalism against money, technology, industry. And I think these, those premises blind them to the good that all of those things uh, do in the world. And so I think that's you know, part of the root of the problem of why it's so hard to quote unquote build. So I, I, there's a lot I wanna drive from there, but let, let's get Tal's perspective on the table and, and kind of circle around. So I, I agree with Jason. I think it's a very positive, uh, uh, Post and I think more, more than anything, the fact that he's responding and calling it a monumental failure is he going is he's, he's going against what you know a tech thought leaders usually do, which is to try to avoid clashing with Washington or saying anything bad or trying to appease them in many way. You know, Zuckerberg is just to give one example. Example is like you leave us alone, we'll leave you alone, and he's he's stepping forward and he's taking a stand and saying it's a monumental failure and this is why we're failing. So I give him a lot of credit and for the courage and the guts because he knows that he's going to get a lot of heat and it's just starting. So the first wave of response is going to be positive from the Silicon Valley, but then when it's, it's going to get to the political commentators, he's going to be slapped. Um, and uh, so I, I think, again, giving him the credit of responding and speaking up um, and again, giving him a lot of credit of, of, of who he is, you know, he's a builder. Anderson Hor Horwitz is a very good uh, VC. Uh, his his uh, partner, Ben Horwitz, wrote a really nice book called The Hard Thing About the Hard Things that I recommend reading. It is really tough to build those kind of, of, uh, of companies and to sustain with the competition and everything. So again, a lot of credit to Anderson about, you know, just who he is and, and the, the fact that he is responding. But I think uh, what the, the main problem that I see in this, uh, and again, I, I won't repeat the positives that Jason just mentioned, because there's a lot of positive of a can-do attitude. Let's get back to the American spirit of fixing things and building things. But I think what I'm seeing is a division of labor problem. It's his lack of awareness that he's, in a way, out of, out of the, the, the solution to the problems that he's seeing is out of the domain of an engineer wanting to build things. And my whole response to this is uh, what we need. I don't think we're lacking imagination or the desire to build or people that can actually and have, have the capacity to build. I think we have a lot of that. I think what we're not seeing is that we're, there's a deeper layer of why don't people want to build more? Why can't they build? And uh, 
I think what we mean, what he is not seeing, maybe for lack of awareness or appreciation of this field of, he says, let's get away from ideologies and politics. You know, we need, just need to build. And I think it's, it's the, this, um, in his mind, maybe the fact that most of the politics and the ideologies that he sees around them are completely futile and irrelevant and just confuse everyone and the lack of effectiveness or any political uh, movement that we're seeing right now. But the fact that there's so much corruption or uh, errors in that field of ideas doesn't make it unnecessary. And so he's in a way pragmatically avoiding that discussion. So for me, the, the overall response is very positive, but my criticism of it is mainly in the division of labor and the need to think in more, in a principled way, in a more abstract way of why he's seeing so many concretes going wrong. What is the underlying common denominator behind it? It sounds like there's some convergence in sort of the critiques that you're raising, which is so for Jason, what I heard is that there's sort of cultural uh, intellectual aspects and premises that are in the culture and that it, uh, and I think maybe your view is that Andreessen has in, been influenced by these ideas and that and Tal, your what I'm hearing from you is that there's a kind of um, there's deeper things to be thought about and and I think some of them are philosophical and so I mean is that a, a fair assessment of sort of where you stand on this it is I would equate it to an engineer seeing engineering problems. And we have a lot of that in, in you know, when you're building uh, products. An engineer will see engineering problems. He won't realize that the problem might be in the math behind it or in the physics behind it, in the hardware that is running everything. Uh, he just sees what he knows. Uh, so yeah, I would say completely uh, a problem of, of, of lack of understanding of the power of philosophy to drive what he's seeing around him, him uh, the, why don't people want to build more? What's going on? Why are we slowing down? And then you can see it. It's very telling. He says, let's get back to our, your forefathers and mothers that used to build railroads, not identifying that the true founding fathers of America are the people who wrote the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence rather than just run and build railroads. The reason why we were able to build railroads is because of you know, uh, innovation in a completely different field, the physics of things, the philosophy, the political philosophy that enabled America to become what it is. So if you're staying at the level of let's build stuff, let's roll up our sleeves and let's get to it, you're, you're not understanding the strategy that is the, the strategic problem that you have in front of you. So uh, what I would recommend to uh, Mark Anderson is to hold on for a second. Maybe the solution lies with other experts who are experts in a different field, which comes even is a more foundational level that you're not seeing. And it's great that you want to go out and, and fix everything, but you might end up a decade from now in a worse situation where even the Silicon Valley that is relatively free to, to uh, build right now will be in the same situation of the other verticals that you're pointing to that are, do not have those freedoms because you don't understand really what's stopping all of us from building more. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Jason. I want to, I want to pretend to be Mark Andreessen and push back a bit. So, so he, let me play, let me see if I can defend what I think his view is. Um, that may all be well and good, but the, the fact is that I don't, I don't think there are enough, so, are there really enough people with vision? Are there really enough people that because you know, I mean, Silicon Valley is a, is a highly concentrated set of people with that kind of orientation. I think it attracts them. But is it true that, for example, in in um, in car manufacturing or in uh, you know in other fields that are uh, very different from tech, do we really have the same kind of vision can do that he's asking everyone to summon in themselves? Uh, which I I mean, just to add one more positive, I think that's a really you guys put it as optimistic. I, I think there's some kind of appreciation here for the value of work in human life, um, not just for so, so, so at a social level, but th so take that kind of pushback from Andreessen. What do you think of that? Do we have enough visionaries? Like, do you, do you I mean, yeah, isn't I there actually, something there? Yeah, again, I, 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 I'm, he, you're right. Uh, Anderson is a builder. He's a 
problem solver. He's an engineer, wants to, but everything for me, everything is tech. You know, he, he by, by, by the way, he coined the term uh, software is going to eat the world or eats the world, right? And he's right. So let's not equate tech with software, right? It's much more to it. The reason why you don't see flying cars is because there's not enough competition and freedom in the world of transportation. Look at Tesla. Is that tech? Yes, it is tech. It's combining software and hardware and manufacturing and, and engineering to the highest levels. And the reason why you don't see more innovation is that why would I go into the, although I love cars, by the way, I truly love cars. Uh, I would not go into the fields of transportation or medical devices or energy because what can I do there, right? It's so regulated. Why, why bother? So I think the reason why he's not seeing more innovation and the reason why he's not seeing flying cars is again, a political problem, not the desire to create. So Elon Musk's you know, has so much energy and so much genius. So he pushes through everything and then Uber pushes through everything and so on, but it's very rare. The majority of the innovators don't have this capacity to push through. They don't have the resources to push through all, all kinds of regulations. Uh, and we have a friend who is creating a supersonic plane. You think it's easy? No, it's gonna be hard. The, the main problem he has, or not the main, but one of the biggest problems he has is regulatory issues of, of sound, bear, uh, of, of sound uh, regulations and speed regulations. And so I mean, on. So again, let, that's let, let, let me add. Um, yeah. So let me let me add a, a a riff or a nuance on that. I think actually the the um, the most devastating consequences are not even the regulations that, for instance, enforce certain safety standards or other standards, which those things imp, uh, impose a certain burden. They add friction. They add cost. But the real devastation that I see is when. Um, it is where um, the entire structure of an industry has been changed uh, because, and, and the incentives are all in the wrong place. And I think the biggest place we see this is healthcare. Um, so medicine is just, the, the, the medical industry in this country is, it's just so, it's been so distorted. It's been chopped into all sorts of different pieces and tangled up and, and rearranged absolutely nothing like you would see if it if it were and it's not because of it's not just because of regulations this is where it's really insinuous it's because of the tax code it's because of the incentives provided by the tax code um not just the tax code that lets you uh uh you know that that has employers provide this as a benefit and so now everybody gets health insurance through their employer and so now you don't have a, a direct relationship you know but it's also um the uh you know the, the the way that nonprofit status protects like blue cross blue shield and then that leads to and now we have this world where insurance actually doesn't only cover accidents and catastrophic it covers like everything that you do and so it's just like all of these you know little changes and unintended consequences have added up to this place where it's really hard to just to make a profit off of ideas that could you know it, it's it's hard to have the right kind of structure um, it's hard to have, uh, you know, the, and so the funding flows, right, that like the money isn't there. And so I think, you know, regulations like um, the FDA needs to approve your drug or the FAA needs to approve your plane or whatever, those things like add friction, they're a drag, they, they, they add inefficiency, um, you know, potentially, but, um, uh, but the even bigger things are uh, you know, the places where it's almost impossible to build, to even build the kind of business you want to build. Education's another example, right? So we give, um, so because we have free public schools for everyone, it, it sucks almost all the profit out of education. And there's virtually no opportunity to create an a, a better school that would serve the, that would serve, you know, the, the middle class and just like the broad variety of people. The only opportunities in education right now are basically premium luxury products for the rich and everybody else basically just gets the same you know kind of uniform standard uh so that's just another example of something where the market as such has been destroyed and uh and so i think those are actually those are the biggest things and if you look at where we seeing the least innovation right and where is there the most um you know drag and and, and friction it tends to be in you know those kind of industries I want to get from you guys some more about um, how you see Andreessen's argument working, what you find, what you think he's going to get pushed back on, what you think he's wrong about or right about. Um, so Tal, just to dig in a bit on your perspective. So you put this in terms of a metaphor of, or analogy to 
there's sort of there's an engineering to think about a problem and certain assumptions that, that comes with and then there's a kind of physics type of way of thinking about things i I've met engineers, but I don't really feel like I know what it means to think about a physics, an engineering problem. So maybe concretize what it looks like to kind of solve something from an engineer perspective. So, and then sort of tie it to what you think is going on in uh, Andreessen's article. So my experience with engineering is that, you know, you, you go into a, a boardroom and, and you present a problem and then a group of engineers just jump on it and say, okay, that's the problem. This is how we're going to fix it. And when you realize that there are uh, people that surface up in management are the people that think more strategically and say, wait, wait, wait a second, before we jump and fix that problem, what is the root cause? Why is it happening? Why did it happen again? Right? We fixed it last week. Why did it happen again? Why, why, what are we missing? Is there something deeper here that we're not looking at? Is, do we have a culture problem? Do we have a quality problem? What's really going on? And the best engineers are the engineers that think more abstractly and more deeply about what's going on. And that's where you see people advancing to like senior levels. They are able to see and penetrate through uh, things that engineers just jump to fix. And I think he's a great engineer and a very strategic one, but not at the level where he's becoming a theoretical physicist, right? To, to continue the analogy. He doesn't have that expertise. The problem is that I, I think he understands that the ideas that uh, are underlying our culture right now are, are, are a problem, but he doesn't appreciate the power of philosophy to drive the solutions for everything that he sees around it because he, he sees po po you know politics is corrupt. All the ideologies around him don't make any sense. It's all fluff, it's subjective and arbitrary, you know, the left things, right, th that, and he actually talks about what the right should do and what the left should do, right? But he puts it in like false, uh, you know, uh, alternatives in from my end. So uh, when I say an engineer, I think he still has this engineering mindset of, I wanna fix this problem for God's sake, right? I see so much craziness going around me and I don't understand why we can just not fix it. And again, uh, I give him the credit that he understands, but maybe not appreciates that we don't need more, and I will say Steve Jobs, right? the best of the best. Of course we need more Steve Jobs, the, the more the better. But the problem is not more people in the Silicon Valley wanting to build, or maybe in all parts of the country wanting to build. It's the problem that they can't, or they wouldn't, or they don't have the incentive to, or even the passion to anymore because the culture is changing. Why is the culture changing? Changing because of underlying premises that we have as a culture and we're losing it. So again, I, I think the point that he makes at the end, going back to history of what make America shows me the, the error. It's not the producers that made America what it is. It's the political scientists. It's the Jefferson, it's the Madison, it's, it's the Hamilton, it's, it's all of the founding fathers who really laid the foundation for the people to then go and explode in, in building and, and what created the industrial revolution of the, of the 19th century. That is where he misses the mark of we need to go a level deeper. I'm go gonna ahead. slightly, I'm gonna slightly disagree with you Tal. I think it's both. And I think you have to acknowledge and, um, and, and promote both. It was absolutely um, the, the you know, foundation laid by the founding fathers, the political context that created the environment. But then within that environment, there were also the industrial heroes, the inventors, um, uh, and, 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 and we couldn't have done it without them. So I think, I think it, you know, up and down the stack, you need to sort of acknowledge and give credit. It really takes the entire thing. Um, I think, uh, I tell the one thing I, I agree with you a lot about is that we need a root cause analysis. And I like the, um, the point of, of pointing out that when you see a problem, um, it, you, you need to do the root cause, especially when you notice this problem has been happening over and over. And in you know, the, the case of the types of problems we've been talking about, it's not a problem that cropped up this year or this decade. It's a problem that's been going on for, for many decades at least. Um, so I think you're absolutely right. We need to say, why does this keep happening? Why, why can this go on for decades and decades? Now, um, I mean, about Andreessen himself, he's a super smart and strategic guy. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll be charitable and, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I won't comment on what he understands or doesn't understand. Um, but I do, but I think what we can comment on maybe is what, what is in this article and what is not in this article and what is kind of needed. You know, it is, it is a rallying cry, as we said in the beginning. I think it's good as a rallying cry. 
Um, but a rallying cry alone is never enough. You know, so, so what really matters is what happens next. What is the strategy that we adopt? What's the philosophy that we adopt? How do we, how do we turn this into a plan and into action? And who's going to be against that plan and why? And how are we going to you know, fight the philosophical and political battle um, as well as just drawing up you know, the blueprints for, for what we're going to build? And I do think that um, you know, uh, some of the, the problems that he, so just going back to what he said, the problem is desire. The problem is will. I think if we, you know, I, I agree with those, but I think uh, we can't stop at that level of analysis. That's like the first level or second level of why. And if you're going to keep going deeper, you need to ask, why don't we have the desire? Why don't we have the will? Um, and I think that, you know, you said, Utah said we don't, you know, that we, it's not as if we don't have the will or the desire to build that plenty of people do. I think, I think it's true that there are still plenty of uh, visionary leaders, entrepreneurs, founders who have that desire and want to go build things. But I do think that the broader um, culture, the broader public does not have enough of a desire and a focus on this type of progress. And I think the problem is that a, a big part of the problem is that their focus is on other things. Their focus is on environmental impact. Their focus is on inequality. Their focus is on um, uh, you know, social justice and all of these things that they're, that they're valuing and elevating above the type of progress that actually has made the modern world and makes all of our lives better. And so, you know, that, that's, I think uh, part of what I'm trying to do. And I think part of what you're trying to do is just continue to drive home how important that progress is, um, how important, you know, scientific, technological, economic and industrial development is that these things are, are uh, moral goods that they are uh, that it's a moral imperative to keep moving forward with all of them and if we can teach the, the you know the whole country or a majority to to value it at that level and to see you know as as I think one of the, the greatest things about about Atlas Shrugged and, and Rand's writing in general is how um, it paints a picture of industrial achievement as a noble pursuit and a moral quest that has that has moral meaning and worth. And that is the spirit that I think, I think if we got that spirit and understanding broadly enough understood, then we could, then people would be demanding, hey, what are all these regulations that are getting in our way? Hey, why don't we have this, you know, and that's, that's really the, you know, where, where it comes from. We need that, we, we do need people to demand that. And then we can start, you know, reexamining this thicket of of regulations and, and, and intervention, you know, in the economy that we've got and, and how to start untangling it and unwinding it. Um, I want to get to some questions we've received on Zoom. So for people watching on YouTube or Facebook, if you want to submit a question, please join us on Zoom. Uh, you can connect 812-506-718. That's the meeting ID. And for those of you on Zoom, I, I have a, a long list of questions here. I'm going to try to get as many in as we can. But before we get to the questions, I, I want to just put this to you guys and see if this resonates with you. So Andreessen doesn't put the point quite like this in the essay, but it's one of the things that I think is a legitimate uh, takeaway from what he's arguing. And I think it's a point we've made, it's a point Ayn Rand made, it's a point that came up uh, last time we met Jason in San Francisco at the conference we held um, on the ideas that can destroy or save Silicon Valley. And so the, the point really is progress is not inevitable. Progress has to be earned and, and supported and, and, and uh, created every step of the way. It's not set to, you know, you don't set it and forget it. It's not anything like that. And one of the things I take from Andreessen is there's a kind of a um, angry, I think rightly angry awareness that how is it possible that we live in America and sort of the most advanced society ever known and we have hospitals where people who save lives can't find personal protective equipment. Like, and I think that's a legitimate thing to be angry about because you, know, you might expect that in a country that is you know, you know, super poor and backward technologically, but not in America where you know, we're conducting this on Zoom, which is like amazing stuff. So, I mean, the, the whole idea of what makes progress possible, what is the meaning of it morally and how do you keep it going? I think that at least, I mean, he's, he's put more focus on that issue, whether that was the goal or not in, in the piece. Because I think you can't read this and not come away thinking, yeah, no, this is not automatic. Like, I mean, if people had this view, 
in the late 19th century that, oh yeah, it's progress is going to be inevitable nonstop. And it wasn't, I mean, the 20th century showed us that. And we're seeing, I think in Andreessen's analysis here that progress is not at all something, I mean, it's super dangerous to take it for granted. And part of what I think he's responding to is the people who don't have ambition for their own lives and they don't have ambition to start companies. They don't have ambition to see growth. They don't even think about how much better things could be. And I think that's part of what I, I mean, I took from your comments, Jason, that, yeah, there is a problem in the society where people don't, they're not visionaries. There aren't enough of those kinds of thinkers. And there's a real issue there. Um, so I, I'm going to, if you guys want to respond, that's fine. I'm going to go to the questions now and, and throw a few at you and see how it goes. Um, so one question on Zoom is about the way Andreessen thinks of building. And the, the question is put, um, it seems like Andreessen is taking a lot of government involvement for granted in, in the, so if you think about the way he talks about we, we need to build. So sometimes it's people like him, investors, and sometimes it's founders and, and people in companies, but sometimes it's, well, you know, there's governments should be building and, and it, it, it seems like he's going back and forth and, and what, what do you make of that and how do you think of it? I think, uh, so a couple things. Um, you know, I think one thing is that, uh, pretty much everybody. Okay. So first off, you just have to, un you have to start from the current context today. Government's heavily involved in a lot of stuff. Um, they're heavily involved in all sorts of transportation infrastructure, other, other physical infrastructure, right? Utilities and so forth. Um, they're heavily involved in, in regulating every industry, uh, in, in financial policy, all kinds of things. So just that is the reality of where things currently sit. So um, I think anybody who's talking about where are, you know, what are we actually going to do starting from today? I think naturally kind of takes that as a reality of here's the current starting point. And then like, what are we, what are we gonna get done? Um, and to some extent, I think that's rational because we can't wait to completely unwind the, the entire regulatory and welfare state and get to full pure laissez-faire capitalism before we start achieving any of these other industrial goals. The other thing I would say, and I'm, I'm guessing here maybe at what his motivation, uh, uh, I'm guessing a bit at what this might be, but one motivation might have been that um, I think he might have wanted to write this for a broad audience that has a number of different political views uh, across both the right and left today and appeal to the best of the spirit within everyone out there that, that, that can resonate with this idea that yes, progress matters, solving problems matters, we can do it, let's go do it. I think, I think that that's the spirit you need to start with in order to then re-examine why can't we do it today? Why are things falling apart? Um, you know, and, and, uh, and, and what is it about the current system that's, that's hampering everything and has, you know, what, how, and like he says, how can we, America in 2020, how could, how could we have gotten to this point? And I think this should be, and I hope it is a wake up call for people to, uh, to examine that. So I think that, you know, that I think he might've been trying, let's start from a shared value that many people have, which is this, that a lot of people can agree on if you have something good in your spirit, which is yes, can do optimism. And from there, build on that to then, you know, down, uh, uh, you know, have that encourage us to sort of ask hard questions about maybe our pre-existing political beliefs. Yeah, um, I agree with what Jason said. By the way, we have no disagreement about the credit that all the builders should get. Yeah, I think uh, it's obvious. Uh, I was just, uh, you know, trying to emphasize the, the, the appreciation that there were people who laid the foundation for all of this to happen. And I, and I will connect it the, the, same, the same way to my answer. I think Anderson in a way is lacking imagine, ima imagination himself. By that I mean is why, you know, where, where can the solution come from, right? Uh, it can come from very, very, so everybody agrees. And I think that exactly what you said, Jason, is, is trying to bring everybody together by, you know, focusing on this, this word build, who doesn't want to build? Who doesn't want to prosper, right? But you know, as, as engineers usually agree on stuff, 
when you go deeper and deeper, this is why Einstein wouldn't talk to other theor theoretical physicists. They just hate each other because the deeper and deeper and deeper you go, it becomes clearer and clearer and more abstract and in a way more fundamental. So it's okay to build by what, 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 why do people build? And then you get into the layer of morality of like egoism versus why is he saying we so much? Because he want in a way to appease everybody. It's like, we is fine. Me, for me, my profit, my, my uh, you know, rational self-interest, that he wouldn't say. And for me, that, that, is the, that is the problem of going deeper or having somebody like Anderson or, or anyone else, by the way, it, and I don't blame him because it's not his role to, to point. But the hard part, and I would say the hard thing about the, the, this hard problem is that you have to go deeper and be as penetrating as an Ayn Rand to figure out that the real problem, the psychological problem, why people don't want to build is that, why should I, you know, why should I go to, to so again, I would say that the deeper you go, the more controversial it becomes. And I'm in the process of writing a, a response letter to uh, Andresen and my response letter is that yeah, you have to have more imagination and to imagine that the root cause for all of this problems. And we have to be, you have to have the courage to say it. It's let's talk about morality. Let's talk about why we're building things. Let's talk about why you, why Anderson Horwitz exists. Make money, make profit as much as possible for your own sake, right? While building. So, um, Again, uh, I would say uh, I completely understand and that's what I expect. And I, I, I think he should talk at that level of let's build, let's try to unite, let's do it. But again, not being uh, unappreciative of the underlying layers. Let me, so there's another question here, which I think goes to some of this and I'll, I'll, I'll take the liberty of answering it. So the question is, I mean, part of what we're struggling with is what is Andreessen's view outside this essay? Because there's only so much you can get from the essay there's questions about what, what he thinks of the implications and so on. And we, you know, we can do our best to interpret his view and, and, and hold him to what he's put in on paper, but you know, it would be great to talk to him. So the question uh, we've got is, would ARI consider inviting Mark Andreessen for a conversation? And my answer is yes. We'd love to continue a conversation with him in person on, on Zoom or however he wants to do it. And I think it's because, I mean, to his credit, he's started a really important conversation. And we, you know, we'd love to be able to contribute to that. And uh, maybe we won't convince him of, you know, various points, but I, I think we can learn from each other and it would be great to have him. So it's an open invitation um, to talk. We'd love to, to do that. And um, let's take a few more questions. We're, we're coming up on, on our time. So let's see if we can get a couple of these in. Um, this is a little bit uh, at a right angle from what we are talking about, but you guys both have sort of expertise with this. So um, what do you make philosophically of governments around the world trying artificially to create Silicon Valley in their own country and region? Do you have any thoughts on that? I'm glad they want to do it. That I think, you know, uh, ho hopefully shows the builder spirit. Uh, I guess that could come from multiple play. It could come from a builder spirit. It could also just sort of be wanting a status symbol. Um, but, um, you know, uh, I, I think a lot of these things, if you're literally trying to, you know, all the how do we create another Silicon Valley, I think um, it's, it usually doesn't work because a lot of what Silicon Valley about is, is uh, it's a network of people. If you're like trying to create another Hollywood somewhere. Well, if you don't, if you can't get all the, all the top people in Hollywood in movie industry, so you're not going to, you know, you make another, you know, Hollywood to rival Hollywood. What really places should be trying to do, I think, if they want to do this, if they're thinking for the long term, is they should try to figure out not how do we create a Silicon Valley of, of computer technology, because that already exists, but how do we create the equivalent city of uh, the next major wave? You know, how do we create the equivalent? How do we how do we make our city into the hub for biotech or um, you know something like that? And uh, and that would be a really interesting exercise if some if some city or government wanted to do that. Um, of course, they would have to figure out what are the incentives to, uh, you know, get all the best people to, to move there. What are the right business structures to um, and legal structures to make it uh, friendly for business and investment to flow there? And 
if they started asking themselves those questions, they might get to some interesting answers. In fact, there are uh, there is an interesting experiment along these lines, uh, by the way, and I don't I think it's too early to, for me to say what's going to what to think of it or what's going to happen. But it's called Charter Cities. And uh, I, I encourage people to check it out if, if only as a, a kind of, you know, very intriguing experiment. But the, the Charter City idea is to um, exactly for, for this, for, for countries that want to have some more economic development, um, to take a city uh, 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 within the country and just give it uh, a new law code, maybe just copy over like British corporate law or, you know, something, some of one of the better places and, um, uh, and just establish a better legal structure really with, with more rule of law, more law and order and more freedom um, uh, uh, and, and more ability to create business and invest and, and work and produce. And um, we'll see if, uh, you know, it's inspired by things like uh, obviously the story of Hong Kong or Shenzhen or, um, uh, you know, and some of those others. And uh, it'll be really interesting to see if that can get happen, maybe create some oases of capitalism within, uh, you know, broader uh, uh, business deserts. Yeah, I've been part of many political discussions about innovation. I'm, I'm a mentor to startups and things like that, and politicians get involved, and municipality wants to know how we can create more of this. So again, it's the same as an engineer seeing an engineering problem, the same politician seeing it as a political problem. And... Um, and that's that, you know, my response every time is like, just, you know, uh, let, let it, you know, step back and let it happen. And uh, I think the, the ideas of charter cities is, is a great one because you can see how much innovation you can get when you uh, bring back the incentives or the freedom to create. Uh, what would happen if one city says, no problem, build whatever car you want. Uh, the roads are open to any kind of experiments. Just, just imagine how much innovation will happen in transportation, you know, or health, of course, healthcare, biotech, uh, gene therapy, all of those things that are in a way uh, blocked in many ways. So yeah, I completely agree with that. Yeah, I was just gonna add before we wrap up that, I mean, I think it depends on what it means uh, from just taking from your comments, it depends what it means for a city or a country to, to do this. And is it, is it they're handing out like, tax money taken from some businesses and companies yeah. and giving it as seed money to others, which I think is completely out of line and wrong. Or is it, are they trying to adopt the sort of examples you gave? Are they trying to learn from the best conditions that make possible human progress and flourishing and science and innovation and, and you know, a high concentration of, of startups? What, how can you replicate those conditions? And I think that my guess is a lot of it is just kind of creating more freedom and opportunity for people to act uh, on their best judgment. Um, and I think that that would be something I mean, my, you know, one of the things I took away from Andreessen's piece was whatever you think of his, his suggestion, or if you disagree, agree, there's one thing that I, I'm really convinced of is we need the equivalent of Silicon Valley everywhere. We, we need people thinking like him, speaking out in every industry. I, go, I wish there were more business leaders who spoke out, who were thinking, trying to think deeply, and I think he is a deep thinker, about society. And you, we might disagree about how they think things need to be solved, but just that kind of effort as opposed to kind of keeping your head down and, and not really trying to sort through. Cause I, I think it's, it takes courage and, and effort to do that. And it's just on top of running a business, right? So it's not like he's sitting at home all day playing solitaire. This is someone who's actively investing and thinking about everything. So kudos to him. And I wish there were more people on that kind of orientation uh, across our society. So. We run out of time, unfortunately, but I want to thank you, Jason and Tal, for uh, sharing your time with us today. It's been really stimulating. Um, well, let's see how this story develops. I'm sure there'll be more to say about this and, and uh, looking forward to seeing Tal's uh, sort of response. And for people uh, interested in Jason's work, you can find it at rootsofprogress.org and you can see his write-up about his reaction to Andreessen, which came up I, a few hours after Andreessen. I don't know how quickly you got that out there, but kudos to you. And we'll be putting uh, show notes about this episode on our site and linking to a few other resources. There's an interesting article by uh, one of our former colleagues, Don Watkins, that takes an interesting position on this. Uh, we'll share that as well. Uh, so thank you all. And thank you all for watching on Zoom, on YouTube, Facebook, or wherever you're watching, or if you're listening to us on a recording, we'll hope you will join us next time for a live taping or uh, again, uh, catch up on the recordings. Thanks so much. And we'll see you next time. Thank Bye. you.